Records and has served as the director of Helping Hand in Albania and Kosovo uh, from 1998 to two, uh, 2000. Uh, but the Ramiz Duka has a, has a very in-depth uh, understanding of the financial issues that Islamic institutions, Islamic schools face um, when when they uh, you know when uh, people get together and try to create an environment like that, so financial issues uh, is his expertise, and he will be focusing on explaining those challenges that Islamic schools uh, face. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Brother Abdul Rashid. Brother Abdul Rashid, I'm right here. Uh, <laughs> please, please join us on the forum. Uh, Brother Abdul Rashid, you have um, already heard him. Uh, he is a pioneer in uh, in starting uh, this innovative idea for uh, for fundraising. Even though you know he also understands, and, and we also understand that uh, we also understand that uh, that we we shouldn't be needing these things. But but we we do the the society that we live in. Uh, these types of things uh, make people think about uh, uh, you know come out of their comfort zones and think about the broader implications of uh, the society that we live in. Uh, uh, before him is Dr. Uh, Salim Khan. Dr. Salim Khan uh, has been practicing child and adolescent uh, psychiatry in Delaware for almost three decades. He is chief of psychiatry, uh, Delaware Guidance Services, and outpatient mental health provider for children and families. He is also the clinical director uh, for child and adolescent services at Rockford Center, Newark, Delaware, the largest private psychiatric hospital in Delaware. He is uh, uh, he's president of Delaware Association of Child Psychiatrists. Uh, Dr. Salim Khan has also served as the past president of Islamic Society of Delaware, and he is member of advisory board of uh, people in Delaware. He has been uh, writing extensively about problems, psychological and emotional issues. He writes poetry in English, Urdu, and Punjabi. Uh, he is uh, is a very generous uh, um, uh, supporter of Islamic education and has always contributed his wisdom in guiding Islamic schools in the area. Uh, he has been associated with Islamic education for a very long time, uh, and we're, we're very happy that that he is here. He will be uh, concluding uh, today's uh, panelist uh, uh, discussion. Uh, we'll start with um, uh, with Dr. Zaid Bukhari. Uh, I'll request um, uh, panelists to uh, to limit their um, uh, talk to uh, to seven to ten minutes, and uh, uh, Brother Ramiz Duka will have pro will probably have a little more time uh, because of his experiences with financial issues, um, and uh, and after that we will uh, open the conversation for uh, for question and answer session. Uh, for question and answers, uh, I'll remind you at that time as well, but. Uh, um, we would like to limit the questions to uh, to one minute. If you like to make a statement, please feel free to make a statement, uh, but limit that statement to uh, to under a minute, so that we can have uh, as many people uh, participate in the conversation as possible. Uh, if we have no no other person who wants to talk, we will let you we will let you continue, and we'll give you more time, inshallah. Uh, Dr. Zahid Bukhari. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulhi kareem, wa azubillah wa shaitan wa rajeem, bismillah Brother Namir Bakit, thank you very much, and the uh, Tarbiya School for inviting us here. Uh, MashaAllah, may Allah bless all these efforts for our brothers and sisters working so hard. What I will do, inshallah, because we have a very learned uh, panel and panelists that was very much involved in uh, Islamic schools and schools and uh, with, the, uh, with the whole issue of uh, uh, mispreparing future leadership. I uh, try to make a couple of points, inshallah, in my uh, time, some uh, experience which uh, uh, living here for a long, a relatively longer time, not as longer as other, some brothers or sisters they, they have. Means when we uh, here in, in America, the Muslim experience is uh, for us, especially we have immigrant Muslims and we have indigenous Muslims. But in America, um, all other ethnic religious groups, they also face uh, to some extent the same problem which we are facing living here, are raising our children. 
Uh, two days before, we had a meeting in uh, in the United uh, U.S. Catholic uh, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishop Office. There are uh, two offices: those who are involved with uh, interfaith relations and those who are involved with social justice. Myself and Brother Naibek, and we were there. So we were discussing certain uh, initiative which uh, Islamic Circle of North America has taken, especially about uh, this uh, defending religious freedom, understanding Sharia. But then also uh, topic uh, turn to uh, to youth because they are very much worried about the, the Catholic leadership and their youth they are becoming more secular. That is the problem. Very simple and straightforward. They mention. Remember that that in this country the best, the most organized private school system was invented by. Catholic and still it is, although it is a little bit declining, but still it is the most, uh, the bigger, a uh, biggest private school system in the country. <coughs> and uh, they were very much, uh, they have the pride. And to some extent, I think the Catholic community and Jewish community, they took opposite direction in raising their future uh, leadership or future children. Catholic established a parallel private school system from kindergarten to all high school and then colleges and universities. They have around, probably around 290 universities and colleges. They are different uh, orders, like Jesuit and Franciscan and all those. So the total university probably they have 290 colleges and universities, like uh, Georgetown is a Catholic university, Loyola and, and, and the Catholic university in DC. Uh, the uh, vice president from this state is also Catholic, you probably you, you know better than uh, myself. The Jewish group, they took uh, the opposite other uh, route and they worked with the public school system. And they were able to cultivate their own uh, issues or agendas in the public uh, curriculum and also got maximum benefit or exemption from the school system about their holidays, about their kosher meal, about their etiquettes, about Holocaust in the, in the, in the, in the private, uh, in their syllabus, all those things. So they were, uh, they were able to penetrate more in the public school system. So these two examples at least we can study. For Muslims, I think we should also have uh, some, uh, although we always talk about the good experience and positive experience, but we should also have some sour experience in the U.S. Those Muslims who came after the World War I and World War II, some communities, they lost. They established uh, Islamic centers. Either the first gen generation immigrant, they moved out, and or they could not maintain their second generation. So the Islam, some masajid in some areas, they were either closed down, or in some masajid, I know the cases where they used to have Juma prayer also and also bar in the basement. In some communities it happened, especially Central America, the, in some communities they came and they also got that experience. And over there, uh, with the second generation lost. And not only here, it also happened in other countries. I remember I was in University of Connecticut in early 80s. I, I came here in 83 and we, I did my PhD from University of Connecticut. I think the first year, second year, we used to have a dawa booth in, the fr in front of the library. I was MS, involved with the MSA. And I remember one uh, person, uh, one student, his name was George. He's from Nigeria. And uh, we were class fellow. But on that day, he came to our booth and he was talking to me and suddenly he said, uh, Brother, I'd like to talk to you. I, we, I uh, uh, moved a little bit farther from the booth. We sat one place and he started crying. And he started crying that I am from in Nigeria. I am a Muslim. Uh, my father was a haji. He did a hajj. But I got married in a Christian family and now my, uh, my children, they are going to church and I am so puzzled. So he was crying and uh, he was not controlling himself. So it happened, I think, it's not a very strange case that here second generation could be lost. So if we hear from Catholic or hear from the Jewish community that the second generation is being secularized and their big worry is that they, 
Catholics are the biggest religious relator in the uh, in this country. They have the huge areas, the retreats and colleges and buildings and offices all over the country. They built huge colleges, but now they don't have students. They have to close down those uh, schools, so and those fa facilities. And in Muslim, even our own experience, not uh, right now, maybe right now also the cases, but previously it happened in other countries, it happened in this country, the second generation could be lost. If we are not worried about, we are not planning and we are not very much determined to do something. So I think these examples, just I'm giving that is, it is not a, I mean, this is an area where we should be very much concerned about. It is happening all, all over us. I think we can see that. I think the, the examples right now in the family affairs, I think 10 years before, I remember we, uh, in the 90s, when I was, uh, I had the responsibility as Secretary General, we used to go to different communities, the Muslim communities. And if we any talk about family issues, so the normal answer used to be, no, no, we don't have any family issues. This is only with Christians and Jews because they are not uh, following Allah's uh, instruction. So they are having family problems. And we, Alhamdulillah, everything is fine. But now after 10 or 15 years, every community, every household is facing those, facing those problems. So it's not a, it's the, the, the point, my, my point is that it is not a strange case. It is happening all around us. It could happen in our own uh, 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 his own household. So for that is the number one point I'd like to mention. The future leadership, I think the primary role is definitely on the, on the parents. Because they will be asked about that. They, we, we are, as a hadith, everybody is a shepherd. And uh, he or she should be uh, accountable about his sheep or his people, those who are under them. So the father and the mother, they will be asked about, they will be accountable to what type of tarbiyah they are giving. And here the problem is, back home, we are very much accustomed to gray areas. For example, this is a very crude example I am giving. Father is not offering prayer, but still uh, he will say to the children, no, you, you should go to a masjid and you should pray. And the person, the children will, will not respond. They say just keep quiet because that's the respect of the fathers. Somebody is knocking at the door and father will very easily say, okay, tell him that I'm not at home. So he will tell him the, uh, the guest, no, my father is not at home. Here, I think I heard all these, and probably everybody has experience. If you like to ask your person, a child, a, it means daughter or son, you have to pray, he will very, very easily hear, she will ask, you didn't pray, why you are asking me? Because that is the, the civilization here. And that is not a disrespect. We sometimes we see this is a very disrespect. Why you are mentioning us? Because it is a, my and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is very interesting that a lot of time parents become good Muslims because they want their child, children should also become good Muslims. And they know that unless they implement themselves, they cannot ask their uh, their son and daughter, you should pray, you should fast, you should read the Quran and Majid and all those things. Here another, uh, just uh, introducing, uh, there is a very famous book in 50s and 60s were written about the, the these immigrant uh, communities. A professor, German professor, Jewish professor, his name was uh, Will Harvard. And the book name was uh, Jewish, Catholic, Protestant. And he did a, a study in Detroit. And he analyzed that there are three generational behavior. He explained that the first generation will come here, and first generation will be very much because always attached to back home, like in Italy, from Greece, from Ireland. They are very much uh, attached to back home. They will read their uh, adopt their own newspaper, their own uh, language. They will maintain that their church or synagogue will have the same kotaba in their own languages, and they will be very much in isolation mode. Second generation will be reactionary. Second generation will think about, oh, our father and mother, they are not very American. We should become more American. We should become more than Americans. We should become American. So they will talk, oh, I hate Italy. I hate your village. I hate your language. And I should have more entertainment and hip hop and all those style 
showing them that we are more American. We just I li like to learn uh, English. No need to learn any village language. And I don't know what type of things you are talking about. And this is the reaction. But then he explained that the ch third generation will be coming back because third generation does not have any psychological issue that our parents are not uh, means American. The second generation have this issue that our first generation is not American. How can I introduce them to my friends? So the third generation don't have that. So the third generation will come back. They will be very in a proud way. They will uh, visit back to back home, their villages as a cultural heritage, and they will uh, they will love to talk about Italy as a as nostalgia and uh, and Greece and uh, and Ireland and all those things. So basically, he said that the American melting point, uh, pot about talking about American melting melting pot, and then also that the third generation will have some surge about the back home cultural uh, cultural uh, heritage. I remember in, uh, so that is the one theory, but I personally think that in Muslims, the things are happening differently. And that is the reason we can talk about. In one of the conference in Joshua University, I just to give you another example. One of the professors, he said that we are very much worried about the first generation immigrants or Muslims. They're talking about Islam and they are very much in, in the Muslim uh, Islam business. But don't worry about that. Second, third generation, fourth, they will forget Islam. They will just like Americans. So don't worry about that. Uh, this American Catholicism, the Catholic of other countries, they will say this is American cafeteria Catholicism. This is not real ca uh, Catholic. They, they have, for that reason, probably no American Catholic could be a pope. That is unwritten uh, principle uh, um, among, among them. That they, because they consider American uh, Catholicism is not a real uh, Catholic. They are very, uh, I, I heard this example, cafeteria, cafeteria, something like that. I don't know why. So my point is just uh, finishing that, that. The point is that this issue is a real one. The second generation issue or the third generation is a very real one. How to raise them? Second point is that the parents are the prime thing. And over there I will say, just becoming a good Muslim is not enough that your children will also be good Muslims. No, because the onslaught, the tides are so heavy, you have to be active in Islam, actively pursuing uh, your Islam, then you can pray and you can also make dua that your children will also be becoming a good, active Muslim and as a role model. And third thing is all those efforts, Different efforts are going on. We should be helpful. We should be supporting all the, those efforts, the Islamic school and Sunday school. Instead, instead of making Sunday school as a as a dumpster, okay, just leave the children and uh, uh, husband and wife. They are good two three hours to shop around and to talk about a weekly level. On the other day, I think we should be involved in that in Sunday school and Islamic school. So, and all those efforts, inshallah, we'll be hearing more. I think then I think we can pray. Then we can. Uh, think about that inshallah and there will be i think uh, in in in, uh, in islam i will say very uh, briefly i think every generation muslims are coming back we have seen the search to going back to basics back to future back to islam in every generation first generation second generation third generation alhamdulillah this is the case we are we have been look, uh, watching but i think more i think the, the very conscious efforts from the parents and from the teacher and from the community leaders they are uh, definitely they are less. I think they are not enough. But we have to make efforts, and then they make uh, dua to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that Inshallah we will be having a future generation that will be uh, means the leader of Islam here without any cultural baggage. Inshallah they will be uh, Inshallah providing real leadership here. <laughs> Salatu al-Salam ala Rasulullah al-Kareem wa ala alihi wa ashabihi al-Azmeen. I think uh, uh, that I made a very profound uh, statement uh, about the various generations of Muslims uh, who have come to these shores and what has happened uh, to them. Uh, studies after studies have shown that this is what this is true, that second or third generation is somewhat lost. And fourth, you include those who sometimes stand up and see you praying and they say, oh, 
And now I remember my grandma used to do that, uh, or uh, that sort of thing. So uh, what was the reason? And what happened? Uh, I think one, when we study the Muslim history in this country of the past uh, few generations, we found that, uh, yes, uh, they were very active in terms of uh, uh, quite a bit of Islamic work was undertaken, even as, as I had mentioned, there were um, the Islamic Center established. But what was missing was really an Islamic school. We continued to send our children to public schools and hope that just because we are Muslims, uh, our children will also remain Muslim. But uh, I think the experience shows us that without concerted effort of both the parents, the schools, and the community, it will be impossible to raise future generation of Muslims who will remain as uh, committed Muslims, or future generation of any uh, of any religion which will remain committed to it. So when we talk about leadership, leadership development, we ought to recognize that we have to establish our own schools. This is not a matter of just an opinion, uh, this or that, or a matter of choice. It is incumbent upon us that we have our schools because our schools are themselves are a sign of leadership. Those who are taught and in public schools, they can at best they can be best copiers and follow best followers, but they cannot be best leaders because they, all they are doing is following a system uh, which has been uh, rusting over the years. But an Islamic school itself is a call for creativity, call for leadership, call for a, an institution which has a mission attached to it. The public schools really do not have a mission. <coughs> Their students do not know who they are, what they are doing in this world, what is the purpose of their life, where are they going, and what indeed is expected of them uh, at the end of this life. So the very purpose of man, as um, uh, Robert Hutchins, a famous um, American educator, said that the goal of the purpose of education is to prepare man as man. But where is that man uh, which the public schools were supposed to have prepared? They haven't prepared a man. They have prepared it, it maybe a technician. They have prepared a doctor, an engineer, but nothing more than that. An Islamic school, on the other hand, uh, attempts and is committed to prepare man as man. A man who will know who he is, what is the purpose of his life, where is he going, and what is he expected to do in this world. A man who is committed to the notion of providing leadership to the world, whose fathers and parents have prayed that Rabbana hablana min azwajana wa zurriyatina qurrat ayunu wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama. That, O oh Allah, make my wife my spouses and my progeny a uh, <clears throat> satisfaction of my eyes uh, and make all of us <clears throat> the leaders <laughs> make us the leaders of even the muttaqeen that is the best because Islam and Islamic school is committed to the notion of excellence uh, we are told in Allah, Ya'muru bil adli 
will assign. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders you uh, with, for justice and along with justice, assign. Assign means excellence. Excellence in all walks of life. As the famous hadith has said that the Muslim uh, is the one who exercises excellence in all, uh, in everything which he does. Even when he has to slaughter a sheep, uh, he makes sure that his razor blades are sharp. So excellence is part and parcel of an Islamic school message uh, to its students. And uh, an Islamic school provides an opportunity to the, the uh, future leaders of America uh, to indeed prepare themselves as excellent leaders, as those who are committed to lead their communities and to lead their society. My brothers, after 9-11, the major challenge which we have faced is indeed the, the challenge of letting people in the U.S. know about us, who we are, what is the purpose of our endeavors, so that they recognize that we are not strangers. We are those who are committed uh, to a particular ideology, but that ideology calls for, uh, for peace and harmony. So the question is how best can we represent ourselves and how best can we indeed be able to uh, tell the American public in general who we are. That task can only be done by the graduates of an Islamic school because these are, the, these are the students and these will be the students who will become the leaders of future leaders with full knowledge of the, what is called the so-called secular education. Uh, inshallah, they will be the best uh, doctors and physicians and engineers. And at the same time, they will be the best Muslims. They will be the most knowledgeable Muslims. Not the Muslims like you and me who went to uh, so-called so Muslim schools and we never got anything out of those Islamic studies courses, uh, barely minimal knowledge about Islam. But here, the effort is that whatever they are studying, integrated curriculum, whatever they are studying, they study in, in this perspective of Islam. They know what Islam has to say about uh, political affairs, economic affairs, social affairs, community affairs, family life, so on and so forth. So they will be most knowledgeable people to talk about Islam, to represent Islam, to lead us as a community in front of the, uh, of the American society and inshallah become the leaders of America themselves. So it is uh, this model of an Islamic school which we are attempting to provide where the most important role is played by the Islamic environment which we try to establish in the Islamic school. An environment which is full of, which is permeated by the fragrance of peace, salam, Islamic brotherhood, and Islamic sisterhood, Islamic morals, Islamic etiquette, Islamic manners, that is the environment in which this child will grow. And inshallah, if he grows in that kind of environment, then with the support of the parents, uh, also, inshallah, he'll be the one who will stand firm on Islam. He will be the one who cannot be shortchanged to his commitment to Islam. And he will be the one who will lead Muslims to the right path and to the right track. That's the kind of individual we are all looking for and not only a full-time Islamic school can indeed do their job. Wa Dawana and Alhamdulillah.
Our next uh, speaker is uh, uh, Sister Sadia. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Firstly, Jazakallahu Khair, Badan Nabid and Tarbiya Committee for arranging this beautiful, beneficial event for the community. It's a privilege and uh, humbling experience to be among all the leaders and scholars. Um, in my brief presentation, I will be covering three major points. Number one, how we can identify the leaders, future leaders among our kids in the community and among our children. Number two, I will be shedding some light on the fact where we as parents sometimes become a barrier for our kids to be future leaders. And number three, I will introduce a formula that I have recently learned from um, successful business leaders um, that we can teach to our kids to facilitate them when they grow up and uh, when it will be their time to choose a career path for themselves. Um, the first slide. Okay, um, so who are the leaders among our kids? If we look uh, to the group of children when they play together, we will see for sure that there is one child who's leading the course of the games and changing the rules of the games or changing the course of the games like he or she will say, let's play hide and seek now, or let's run together, let's climb the tree. And the rest of the kids will follow that child. And uh, that child who is uh, leading the games will have that attitude like, follow me, and uh, let's do this or that. Uh, so this is the characteristic of a leader. And uh, as parents and community members, we should be identifying these characteristics and encourage that and not to ridicule that bossy attitude. Also, if we look into the group closely while they play, there will be another child who is um, uh, probably showing the care for the rest of the group. If a child falls behind while running, he or she will make sure to uh, integrate that child, bring that child back to the team. <laughs> so that is also another kind of leadership. So what I saw and learned that there is two kinds of leadership or leaders. One is from the front with the attitude of follow me. And then another leader is from the back who can who is more caring and like when they grow up they will be like conducting shura to uh, decide a matter and bring the harmony, bring the people or I mean, if it's kids, they bring the kids together uh, towards the game. So for for us, as parents and community members, we need to take care of these both types of leaders and encourage them to have those characteristics and not just uh, shut them off. So the next point that I'm going to talk about is sometimes we as parents, and it's like not sometimes, uh, more often, uh, we make some very discouraging comments to our kids when they grow up like this. And that is, that acts as a barrier for them to succeed or whatever they do because they don't get to be what they want to be um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us each one of us specific skills blessed us with the unique qualities and oftentimes we fail to identify those qualities and we end up choosing a career or whatever we do that we don't do best sometimes we don't even like best and at the end of the day we say I don't like my job. I don't. I don't want to be doing. I mean, I don't want to continue this, and I want to switch. So that is because we fail to identify those gifts in us. And the worst that we can do is to decide for our children to follow the same course. So what I found uh, and realized that number one, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given us special skills and gifts. Number two. Allah is the one who puts in our heart a uh, passion or interest for something. And number three, Allah is the one who provides from his bounty. 
if we can bring three things together and uh, utilize all these uh, unique skills and believe in Allah's baraka and put alcohol in Allah and do what we do best or like best, then surely, inshallah, there is a good possibility we can bring leaders among ourselves. And uh, we, if we teach them to our kids, then inshallah, we can fi find more and more leaders in future. So there is a formula that I have recently learned from successful business leaders. Uh, and I named it three in one success formula. So if our ch kids, when they grow up and it, it's time for them to decide a career for themselves, no matter what it is, there has to be three key ingredients. Number one, it has to be a benefit. And benefit not only for himself or herself or the family, but it has to be beneficial for the society, for the community, and for, for the entire Ummah. And number two, it has to have fun. Because a child, I mean, when they grow up, I mean, if we don't like, if we don't uh, have passion for what we do, we cannot go so far. It will be stalled after a certain point of time. And number three, profitability. There has to be a way to uh, have sustenance from within that same thing. Otherwise, uh, the focus will be in multiple places. And that way we cannot expect leaders uh, in the work. So uh, obviously we need to communicate the, uh, the fact that be the best. Whatever you do, be the best. And be a leader, not a follower. Now, people can say that if everybody uh, is a leader, who will work or who will follow? But that's uh, not what I meant here. If you communicate them to be a leader, they will be leaders in certain things, whatever they, they have passion for. But not necessarily they will be leaders for everything. So a doctor is a, can be a leader in, uh, in his subject areas, but he's not the leader in all the other areas. So whatever we do best, just communicate our kids uh, to bring the best out of them. And last but not the least, I think this is the very easy step to um, uh, bring leaders among ourselves and among our ch children. It's first and foremost, uh, teach them to do istikhara and for ourselves also do it zikara, the first and foremost and then follow your heart because once we do it